If you want to go to Crafty Fire online, it's on Google Play. I'm sorry, it's only on Android. You can now download the app and go and check for this. At the moment, we are trying to use this app in places where we are producing juvenile microcrafts in very few places, only around seven in the whole of the Philippines, to see if one, we can either segregate the juveniles and increase the income of farmers, second, to see if it will improve productivity of farms. So I guess that's one example of how we integrate the analysis, DNA sequences, and mobile computing. Next. Here's another one. It's called Crab Map. One of the things that we have been experiencing while we were working in Tesoro and in Nipot was that local farmers were asking us, local Belgians, that we would like to expand our activity. Which way do we go? Do we go forward, backward, east, west? And that was just, I told them, so many factors, environment and the availability of habitat. But one of the major things that is going to be an issue will be climate change and temperature. So this is a very simple analysis. You know, it's very simple. I tell you, it is a hypothesis that begs to be tested. So it is not restrictive, prescriptive. It is just a hypothesis. So if you can imagine with me, range of temperature and variation. You go to the web, there is amazing the amount of information available in the websites on temperature data over 20 years. These are model-based, and they are at the resolution of half meters, one kilo, uh, sorry, half kilometers to one kilometer. Using that data, we created a sort of analysis looking at range and variation. Can you imagine high range high variation. That will most likely be a bad place to put your, your pond, but a good place to get your crab. If you think of low range and low variation, that might be a very good place to put your pond. But also, if the crab comes from that place, that will be a very sensitive crab, because it's only exposed to very little variation. So these are all hypotheses. So coming up with the map was our first priority. Using that high range, high variation, high range, low variation, high range, low, uh, high variation, and low range, low variation. We mark pixels on the, on the map, and this is what we got. So that's in Dorgo, that's Palawan, Cagayan. We did one for Panay, and we did one for so these were the sites where we tried to test our hypothesis regarding possible expansion of aquaculture activity irregardless of species only looking at temperature change. And we also created a hypothesis that if this were the climate environment, those were the maps we were creating. <coughs> Remember our idea that low variation, low range will create very sensitive crabs and high variation, high range will create resilient crabs. So we got the crabs from these sources, given long-term data and climate data. We brought them to the lab in setups, kept them at 26 to 27 degrees per week, and then start heating a second group as compared to the other. So when we heated the crabs, we heated it up to 32 degrees, and we killed all of them and used transcriptome. We lose total RNA expression. The hypothesis will be, if a crab was resilient, the difference between its transcriptome in the higher temperature and the lower temperature will be very small. Whereas crabs that were exposed to high temperature and low temperature and were not resilient will be screening. And you will see that in the transcriptome. So this was our initial study, and these were our initial first reactions. Just looking at the genes that were variously uh, expressed, you could see which crab is screening. So looking further, we also did enzyme antioxidative stress assay using EGARS, malonaldehyde, catalase, uh, superoxide bisphenase, and we also did heat shock protein expression using QRT-PCR. 
So all the data, this is just completed last week. So we are just in the middle of wrapping up our presentations, and I think that's the first time we'll be actually talking about this, and we're kind of happy about it. Um, we now have results coming in from different streams of data. And we really see now, because that crabs are actually dependent on temperature adaptation, and where you get your juveniles matters. If you have sensitive crabs, keep them in the same place. If you have resilient crabs, you can catch them all over the place. Next slide, please. Another problem that came to us, just working on crabs, was molting. I looked at the data from Vietnam, and Vietnam produces less crabs than the are in the yard. And wondering why it is because Vietnam produces soft shell crabs. And the difference in the price is very big. 700, 800 from the regular crabs, and then almost 2,000 for the soft shell crab. The difficulty with soft shell crabs, however, is that they are just a product of some availability at sorry, early molting. If you catch them when they're molted and freeze them, you get a soft shell crab. If you don't catch them when they're molted, they harden. The other thing is, if you are looking at juveniles in hatcheries, if they do not mold at the same time, the first molters will be cannibalized by the later molters because their bodies are soft. So one of the things that hatcheries are very adamant about is to make sure that the crabs all mold at the same time. And the current practice is looking at the dactyl, the swimming legs, and look at the outline of the dactyl, and they'll outline how big they are, and basically tell you whether it's intermold, postmold or primo. I'm more interested in the primo than the primo. Okay, so we were trained by the people in the field. They taught us how to do this, and we tried to do it ourselves. Look at the picture on the left. Those are our, our red, green, and blue crabs. These were those that we identified as small thing, intermol, primo, and postmo. And then we use H is, ah, sorry, QR to PCR expression of two hormones. We screen for five, but we only ended up with two. A mold inhibiting hormone, MIH, and a mold promoting hormone, ERK. A simple ratio of promoting and inhibiting hormone will somehow be an gauge of whether a crab is in pre mold, inter mold, or post mold. So looking at that data, we now know that there is one group here, and there's one group there. So most probably, this is pre-mold, and the ones over there are post-mold or inter-mold. And look how successful we are in identifying it by ourselves. If we were successful, all those would be of the same color. Unfortunately, it is not. Next slide, please. Using that same data, however, and looking at the dactyl again, using an image analysis system, working on some sort of artificial intelligence, asking the computer to tell us how to differentiate as opposed to using our own eyes to differentiate. Look at the graph right now. That is a very clear <coughs> difference between the MIH and the ERK. So this is something that we find very interesting. And we're working with the pilot of computer science. We don't trust our eyes anymore. But those images were taken with a phone attachment on the <coughs> So you know those, those small tiny attachments. We were trying to do that. And hopefully, when we get to do this better, because using the other technology, we needed a stereo microscope. But we were hoping to kind of make this more available and more accessible <coughs> for those who are actually doing soft shell crab and those that are identifying uh, hatching juveniles. Next slide. For a thing, the SNPs. Uh, I'm not so sure if our foreign counterparts will understand, but crabs actually come in three sexes. One we call male, that's the end of and one we call female, and one we call the intermediate. The female is priced for its row and its big size. The male is basically not looked at. The intermediate is more expensive than the female because they say it is better tasting and it does not have the calorie content and cholesterol of the raw of the female. 
In uh, the market we've seen, it's about as much as 200, 150 pesos per kilogram difference. Can you imagine what it would do for a farmer if its produce was more the intermediate? When we ask the Bureau of Fisheries, they go with a female. It's a female that has not either been uh, fertilized yet, or it's a female that is being mature. So basically, we wanted to know, is this male or female? That was her answer. Their now question is, can we find a marker, if it's a long term, to breed for more of the snake maturing female? And that's when we came in with snakes for genome-wide genetic studies. So right now, we're actually, sorry, uh, for the SNPs, we're actually looking at uh, uh, following a cohort of, we know who the mother is. We don't know who the father is because the crabs come to us already pregnant. They come home pregnant. <laughs> we have to figure out we're following the cohort, looking for males and females and intermediates. And we have our initial uh, three samples of genome wide uh, markers which we have to use. Next slide. So finally, we're looking at Trizac and Jose. This came as an opportunity for us to work with Taiwan. The South China Sea is a major area of. Uh, of controversy, and that's when you can also get research funds to do collaboration. Um, we were working with this group, Shine Clamps. This is how I was born with my master's degree in anything about the genetics of the giant clamps. There are still giant clamps in the wild. <coughs> so, what we basically tried to do is discuss a possible area of study, and that was to look into the population genetic structure of the giant clamps in the South China Sea involving Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines. So this is just a population genetic study. Next slide, please. But we also started trying to look into temperature resilience of the organism. The Marine Science Institute is very big in giant plants. They have hatcheries and all of those things. So we were basically just trying to work on a temperature resilience study very much like what we did in the macro crabs. So looking at all of these, it gives us an opportunity to be in next slide, please. Just be relevant in terms of the discussion on the South China Sea. So uh, you know, I go back full circle. I was born with the Marine, I am in the Marine. But at the end of the day, it was a struggle to be relevant as a molecular geneticist in the field that had very limited equipment in my lab. But generally, we can do transcriptomes and do genomics because we outsource this. But the key here was partnership. The key here is keeping our ear to the ground and responding more to questions of the individuals that we are working with in this area. So for the conservation.